Hello, wonderful viewers. Welcome to today's edition of Being the Help I Needed. My name is Theophilus Lamte, and this broadcast is on the Theophilus Lamte Ministries on YouTube and Facebook. You'll want to check us out and subscribe and invite a friend. Encourage them to also come and enjoy the things that God is teaching us here. It's been a blessing to me, and I get a lot of comments and feedbacks, and I'm really excited that people are enjoying what God is doing for all of us. You don't want to just be selfish about it because if it's good news, then you want to share it with someone else. So it's about time. Just call a friend, message a loved one, an old schoolmate. Just let's get everybody in, in, involved as we prepare ourselves for the times that are ahead of us. It's not going to be easy. It's not going to be rosy because prophecy has made us understand that there are going to be turbulent times before the world comes to an end. And we are already seeing symptoms and signs of it all over the world. Nations against nations, son against father, mother against daughter. There are things that we cannot change in prophecy. But the only thing that you can do about it is to be at the right side of prophecy. So when things get difficult, Bible said it already, and it's very, very clear that the love of many are going to grow cold. Why is that supposed to be the case? Because iniquity and wickedness is going to abound. So when we see the trajectory of how things are getting um, out of place and everybody is kind of um, frustrated and traumatized, you can see that we are beginning to hit that pinnacle where wickedness and iniquity is on the rise. And because of that, the love of many will grow cold. But I pray for you that your love will not grow cold. So some of these teachings, God is inspiring us to learn them, to imbibe the lessons in there so that when the time comes, we will know exactly what to do. Shall we say a word of prayer? Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, we bless your name. We thank you for another beautiful time that we are gathered here, that you will teach us by your spirit. We pray that I will be out of the scene and people will see God. You speak to me and through me to all my lovely viewers that are gathered, that you brought them by the instrumentality of the spirit of God to be um, receptacles of the things that you are about to teach us. We pray, Lord, that you, Lord, will bless us and keep us safe. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray with thanksgiving. Amen. Beloved, you are especially welcome to today's edition, and we are going to continue from where we ended last week. Last week, we were talking about the three Hebrew boys that ended up at getting into the fiery furnace. Today is going to be an extended version because we are going to take our time a little bit, see how they got into the fire, and see what God was trying to achieve. Don't forget we are still on God using young men. And the most frightening part of it is that you will not get the details. God is using you for ministry. God's, God has an agenda. God is trying to um, achieve a particular purpose in your life. But until you come to that realization and understand that your life is for the glory of God, you would want to question everything that seemingly is not going right with you. But I want to submit to you this morning, this afternoon, this evening, based on your time zone, that God will do whatever he has to do for his name to be glorified. The earlier we accept that truth or that fact, we would align ourselves properly with the purposes and ordinances of God concerning our life. And how can you do that unless you go into the chronicles of heaven and find out what has been written or documented about your life. There is a handwriting of God about us, and the devil also has a handwriting of ordinance against us, that whatever God has planned, the devil has a contrary agenda to that, to make sure that we will not fulfill the assignment of God. But today, the blood of Jesus is available. I pray the blood of Jesus will blot out every handwriting of the devil against your life, so that it is only the perfect counsel and will of God concerning me, concerning you, that will be fulfilled at the end of the day. But this would only be a fluke. If all we do is talking about it, we have to be obedient to God's word. Because obedience to God's word is what opens up the portals of power for the believer. The moment we disobey God, we lose our place in the Garden of Eden where every provision has been made and we are just supposed to be managing them. We now enter into another realm where we go and work so hard because there is a curse that is allocated to us anytime we disobey the ordinances of God. May God deliver you. May God deliver me in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.
So we are continuing with the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And last week I said that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that name was the name they were given when they came to Babylon. Their original Hebrew names were Ananiah, um, Mishael, and Azariah. And because of the way culture is, if you are not careful, people that are trying to control or rule you, they will impose their, 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 their food, their habits, and other things, their language. And another very important thing people do is to change your name. So it's, it's, it's quite interesting that from Sunday school, most of us did not know the real Hebrew name of these three young men. All we knew was Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But today, um, like we started last week, at least you you go back and um, get to know their original Hebrew names before they adopted these three um, very interesting Babylonian names. We saw that last week as well. I made a point and I said that we shouldn't only be interested in the promotions that comes from favor. Whenever you are promoted, what it means is that there is also an allocation of challenges problems or temptations that come with that new level. Somebody will say that every level has its own devil. So new levels, new devils. So we shouldn't be um, ignorant of the fact that when we are moving up, when we are advancing, there are also um, equivalent challenges that we are supposed to surmount at the end of the day. But it's only the believer that becomes careless when things begin to go well. So sometimes God will allow a challenge to come on, I mean, poke us so that we will come back or um, wake up from our slumber. I pray that we will take these things very serious. The higher we go, the more connected we need to get to God because it is a major risk to be promoted or to um, advance in whatever you are doing and you are rather detaching yourself from God. The devil sees you as an easy prey and you don't want to fall um, victim to that kind of a scheme. So the three Hebrew boys had been set up and I said also that it's quite interesting. Where was Daniel at this time? Where were the other Hebrew boys? But they looked as if this particular um, temptation had been designed for these three boys because they were not the only Hebrew boys or the Jewish guys that were taken captive from Judah and brought to Babylon. There were a lot of them. But I also want you to understand and appreciate today that the devil will have specific temptations for you. Not everybody will go through the challenges you are going through. Not everybody will go through the trials you are going through. Everyone has a unique temptation that the devil is bringing towards you because of what he wants to do in your life. So then when we were looking at the case of Daniel, you realized that it was as if there was no other person who was praying in Babylon who came from Judah. Because they said Daniel was praying and as was his custom. But the custom of all these Hebrew boys is also prayer. Why didn't the Chaldeans and the wise men go for the other Hebrew boys? But they went targeting Daniel. That goes to inform you that it was specific to Daniel. And this time around, these challenges and this thing that they were trying to set up is specific to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So it's possible that Daniel was not around when all these ordinances were being pronounced, or it's possible that <clears throat> it was just, I beg your pardon, it was just designed for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So as a believer, you should understand that there will be times when you are the sole target. And that's why sometimes it's very funny or it's a selfish statement to make and say that, why me? Why you? Because you are the target. It's not because all of you are believers or all of us are believers in a particular place. Everything should happen to all of us. No. God said that I will not allow or I will not permit anything to come to you that I have not given you grace to deal with. So you might have grace to deal with a particular thing. It doesn't mean that I have grace for that. So if God does not allow it to come to me and he permits it to come to you, why are you asking that why you and not me? Because we are both believers. Why am I also asking God, why me and not my fellow brother or my fellow sister? Because I am going through a unique um, set of challenges. God knows that he has put in me things that will help me to be able to withstand those challenges. So it's for me to rather unearth those giftings and those abilities in me that will help me to be able to surmount it and cause the name of the Lord to be glorified. Brethren, whatever you are going through, the moment it becomes harmonious, that is what we call testimony. 
because it's not interesting it's very it's very painful but when you go through it and the victory the victory comes that is what we call testimony so then somebody will listen and be encouraged but if you understand the fact that somebody has to rely on your story or your test which will become a testimony to be energized you will not become selfish i will not um become selfish or sentimental and keep saying that god why am i going through this and how long am i going to suffer this but i'll pray for grace to endure i'll pray for grace to endure so that i will learn the lessons that has been allocated for me in there so we also see that these three hebrew boys were very confident they were so confident to the point that when they were brought before the king the king even gave them another leeway, another opportunity to escape the death trap. But they were so resolute. Initially, they said, God is able to do this. That is to deliver us from this fiery furnace. And then they move on to the next gear. They said, God will deliver us. That is certainty. They were so sure. And that is faith. And faith means God will do it, but I don't know when he will do it. So if I don't know when he's going to do it, then I'm going to go into trust. Trust means even if he decides not to do it, I will still not back out. So they said, King, you know what? Don't worry yourself to give us another opportunity for us to reconsider whether we will bow to this image or not. We are resolute. We are not going to bow because we know our God will deliver us. But just in case he decides not to deliver us today for whatever reason that, I mean, he's, uh, he's, he's entitled to, we will still not bow to you. And we are going to continue from there. You see that th this thing really got the king very angry because he thought he was trying to give them another opportunity to reconsider the kind of person he was, that he could end their life and cause them all this pain and anguish and challenges. But these guys were not moved. And that is what we are looking at. Sometimes we get to a situation and um, the devil knows that when he increases the intensity or when he begins to point out all the parameters, laying it bare before us, we will change our mind. So you said no to that temptation that the man brought to you to sleep with him for money because he wanted to help pay your fees. But what happens when they begin to start school fees? And that is the time where the man will resurface again. And then you begin to think twice. Am I really going to go out of school? What happens when you're about to be thrown out of the house, the man promised to pay so that he will have an affair with you and you, you blatantly refused it. And then they decide to not throw you out. They pack your bags. And that is the time you begin to reconsider. But my dear sister, my dear brother, I want us all to believe and behave like the three Hebrew boys. Even if they throw us out on the street, if the only thing I have to do is to compromise my faith, for that, then I'm ready to sleep on the street. If I have to be sacked from school and I don't have any option, but the only option is to sleep with Potiphar's wife, God forbid I would become an uneducated person. That is the stage we need to get to. We need to build that strong faith. We need to be confident in the God we serve. We need to decide that I mean, whatever it is, we've decided that we are going to be with God forever. We are not going to change sides at all because I said the other time that when we begin to become double-minded, Bible refers to us as the, the waves of the sea. We are very unstable. Today we are up, tomorrow we are down. That is not the kind of person you want to be. And the Bible says it clearly as well that if you behave like the waves of the sea, which makes you become somebody who is not very certain. You will not receive anything good from the Lord. That means your Christianity is going to be in vain. So today we are looking at it from the verse 19 of Daniel chapter 3. After the king, Nebuchadnezzar had given the three Hebrew boys an opportunity to come out and reconsider their decision. Probably he thought he was putting some fear into them so that they would reconsider and decide to bow down. They said no. And then let's see what happens from the 19th. And I read, Then was Nebuchadnezzar full of fury, and the form of his visage was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Therefore he spake and commanded that they should, they should hit the furnace one seven times more than it initially was. At this time, he was full of fury. Initially, he was trying to put fear in them. But he realized that the fear was not working. 
And one thing that we also need to know is that the most trusted weapon of the devil is the spirit of fear. So when the devil entered the Garden of Eden, he left fear with them on our words. So when God was coming, as he used to come in the coolness of the day to have fellowship with them, and he called, Adam, where are you? He said, I was afraid. Where did Adam get to hear that word from? It was because the devil had visited them. So as a sign that the devil has been in your territory, you will, you will begin to sense fear. Whenever you get afraid, the devil has visited you or the devil is with you in your abode at that time. Fear is the trusted weapon of the enemy and you don't want to harbor it. When he injects fear in you, anything else is possible because fear will lay the foundation for whatever the devil wants to do to your life. May God deliver you from the spirit of fear. So after the fear did not work, he became angry because he didn't know what else to do. So he decided that, you know what? I was trying to be nice to you. Now I'm not going to be nice to you again. Let them heat the, fa- the furnace seven times stronger than it used to be. Probably it will, it will frighten you a little bit. But these are resolute people, like I said. And they were young men. So beloved, in our prime, in our young age that God is using us, it might not be in front of the pulpit. It might not be because you are an evangelist and you've gone to do a crusade. In your office, amongst your siblings, amongst your colleagues, among your peers in school, God is using you for something. You can be pushed to the wall. The one who is trying to oppress and frustrate you can intensify the challenges, the consequences. And these are to my young brothers and sisters who are in the secondary school. Sometimes the senior will bully you just to get you into um, an evil act. All this lesbianism and masturbation and gayism, everything, most of this smoking and drinking starts from the secondary school. I know now it's getting out of hand. It's starting from the junior high, but the senior high is where it is really intensified. And sometimes you will be forced forced into it, stand your ground and God will come through for you. Don't compromise. Don't compromise at all. May God strengthen each and every student who is under some form of oppression by a demonic agent to toe the line of the devil. May God come through for you speedily in Jesus' mighty name. After the furnace had been heated, 20 said, then he commanded the most mighty men that way in his army, to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and to cast them into the burning, fiery furnace. The devil will bring his best men forward. So when you see that the battle is fierce and you see that everything around you is not working, it's because the furnace had been heated seven times. It's because the best of the soldiers have been assembled to come and bind you. But hold on. Don't give up. Because God is doing something in your life. God is about to give an explosive miracle through your life. But you only have to trust God that God will never leave you nor forsake you. And if you come to the point and understand that you are a sacrifice on the altar of God, that cannot be taken out. You allow God to be God. You allow God to be God. If it means that they will have to sack you from um, that company because you decided not to compromise their smoking and their drinking habits, it's because you decided not to commit adultery because that is the norm for the day. And every man or woman who is married there is committing adultery for promotions and other perks and benefits. And you decide not to do that. Be ready that they can fire you. And when they fire you, be excited. Stand in front of your boss and pray for him and thank God for his life. And depart in peace. And you see that you begin to heap coals of fire on their head. I pray for strength for anybody who is going through persecution in their schools, in their offices, in their community, amongst their family kinsmen, because they are standing for what is right. When you stand for God, God will stand for you. Vengeance belongs to the Lord. Keep on doing what is right. Stay with God. Don't give up. Don't give up. Be like the Daniel. That no matter what it is, you are going to lose all the luxury and the things that you are enjoying, but you will not give up. At the end of the day, I can guarantee you that God will make a statement with your life. And it will cause a lot of souls to be won to the kingdom. When you begin to visualize it like this, you will not become emotional and try to preserve your life. I told you last week that them that preserve their lives, they will lose it. But them that will lose it for the sake of Christ, they would receive it in this life and the life after. Let's give our life to Jesus as a living sacrifice. Our life to Jesus. Everything we are doing is supposed to be for the kingdom. 
So, beloved, you are in that company because you're supposed to be the light there. The place is full of darkness. And when I say darkness, I don't mean it is darkness and you cannot see. I'm talking metaphorically that the place is, 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 in, is in deep sin. And you are supposed to be the light to that place because Jesus is the light of the world and Jesus lives in you. So your identity is because Christ in you, the hope of glory. You have hope for a glorious future because there is Christ in you. So what is it that you go to that company when you are carrying light and yes, still you are enjoying the darkness with them? Why is it that your colleagues, when they see you coming, they even invite you to come and, and share in their evil agendas, all the gossip and backbiting, they call you to come and chair the meeting? Why is it that when they are doing all these, they are sinful acts and they are trying to chase all the young ladies that have come to the company and promising them to keep them retained in the company? Because these are people that are desperate for a job. Look at the way the economy is. And these young um, people have come for national service and internship and attachments. And these men who are being demonically manipulated to cause these young people to live a sinful life, begin to manipulate their lives, and you are part of the gang. Yes, still you are an elder, you are a deacon, you are you are a, a, a pastor, you are the head of the worship and lead and, and praise team. Some of us are even intercessors. Yes, still when we go to our workplaces, nobody can identify us with where we come from. Our Christianity ends at church. When we step out of the of the gate of the compound of the church, nothing about us shows Christianity. This is not the kind of personality God is looking at. This is not the kind of personality Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were. This is not the kind of personality Daniel was. You see, so our, our yielding to the lordship of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ it is what gives us power. But we've, we are living this segmented Christian life where we have a part of our life where God is in control. And other segments, we've told God that, God, please don't, don't come to this side. God, you know I'm a man, I'm a young man, I need, I need to have a little bit of fun. I, I, I know I will marry, but let me have a little bit of fun. I rebuke that spirit in your life in the name of Jesus. That is not a good thing to do. The devil is only trying to sow seeds of discord, seeds that he will deal with you in the future, in your soul. So your soul becomes so corrupted. At the point in time, you can't even pick the voice of God anymore. Everything about you has become carnality. Oh, well, you know, I don't drink, but you see, I, I'm, 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 I'm such a, a nice person and I don't want people to feel like, you know, you see, the believer likes this. I don't want people to feel like, I don't want people to say that I am being holier than thou. I don't want that kind of title that is like, oh, you are too crif. And the moment they see you becoming too serious with your Christian life, then they begin to call you a pastor or a prophet or whatever it is. Is it a bad name? Somebody is proud being called a prostitute. Somebody is proud being called a gambler. Why are you running away from being called a pastor? Why are you running away from being called a man of God or a woman of God? Why are you running away from being called a church mount? Is it a bad name? Whatever you are called, you will become. Because spirits will manipulate everything about you to make you happen, get to that kind of uh, place in your life. So when they are calling you a pastor, it's a good name. Accept it by faith. And you see that every element of this earth will begin to, will begin to work together to make sure that that happens. It is only a bad name that you reject because spirits will also make sure that that comes to happen in your life. So don't compromise because you want people to like you. Not everybody even loved Jesus although he came to die for the whole world. So if they did not love Jesus absolutely, why do you think they are going to love you? And Bible said that you are a hypocrite if everybody talks good about you. When you go into the midst of the believers, you are hailed. When you come among the unbelievers too, you are the top of town. Everything is about you. How is it that you are able to manage it? And the Bible said that you cannot serve two masters. You cannot love the world and you cannot love God. You must hate one to love the other. Because the world is in enmity with Christ. So why is it that the world loves you that much? And you claim you are also a, 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 a staunch believer. It's not possible. And one of the greatest deceptions that we are not even paying attention to is self-deception. Claiming to be something you are not. You are the worst of people here on this earth. May God deliver us, may God help us, that we will be strong, we will stay firm because we were sent into that company for a reason. Some people's deliverances are connected to you being the light there. Yes, still, you are a bulb and you don't put on the light. 
So when you go in the midst of the darkness, you turn off the light so that you can mingle with them. You are not called to mingle with them. You've been called to stay out. You've been consecrated. You are separated from amongst them that you can bring them deliverance. You are a light that has been, that has been put out. The, the kind of luminance you give is supposed to brighten the whole place and give them a sense of direction. Why are you destroying souls by not using the intensity of the light that you have? And that light is Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. So as we continue, you, you are about to see that the aim for which God permitted or allowed the three Hebrew boys to be put in the fiery furnace is now about to be realized. So it, it gets to a point when Nebuchadnezzar is now amazed. But Nebuchadnezzar will never have been amazed if the three Hebrew boys compromised their faith because he was scaring them because the strongest of the soldiers were sent to bound them. Because they did not budge at any point in time. It got to the point where God wanted to achieve the purpose for this assignment, which he did not tell the three Hebrew boys about. Like I said, probably would have been so interesting to tell them, you know what, I'm allowing you to be taken to Babylon because I have an assignment there and I'm, I'm going to make sure that the, the lion will not touch Daniel. And after Daniel, I'll also make sure that they will try to put you in, a, in, in, in some fire, but it will, not, it will not burn you. So get ready for that. Clap for yourself. This is all what we expect, but I can guarantee you, you will not get anything like that, but you will still go through the trials and the challenges. But if you give up on God, you failed heaven. Because heaven will sit and boast about you, about something God has given you ability to do, and the devil will come and test you. If you, Just in case you don't believe me, go and ask Job. Job did not get an SMS. He didn't even get any, any dream or vision about what the devil was about to do to him. But look at what he went through. He lost all his materials. He lost all his sons and his daughters within a short period of time. And he did not still get any signal from God. As far as that was concerned, God will just wait and see how you handle it. So you see, this, this Christianity thing is like going to school for a period of time where you are supposed to acquire knowledge. And at a point, there will be external examiners. The devil is part of the external examiners if he's not the head of the external examiners. Because God will now have to sit back. So God is our teacher, our day-to-day -day teacher or our lecturer but when it's time for examination the external examiners will have to come and validate whatever our teachers have been teaching us so the the, the the teacher that stays with you all the time will stay away so god will stay out and he'll just be watching from afar expecting it is his hope and aspiration that we will pass with flying colors and the credit goes to him that he taught us well so god we will just oh i know this is a very good student and i've taught him well and blah blah oh fine okay so let's just go and check out um how he can be able to handle these things and then they will present the test to us and we will fail miserably what shame are we bringing to god so beloved whatever you are going through now as i speak to you in the name of jesus i pray that you will come to that realization your perspective will change and analyze and see that god is trying to make a statement with your life what you are going through now is not the end of your life. It's just a face that you are going through. But God is bent on making a statement with it. God has boasted about you that no matter what this man will offer you, you will not commit sin with the man. You will not commit adultery. You will not fornicate no matter the challenges you go through. In fact, God said that it is not because of the protection or any material he has given you. That's why you are living a holy life. But the devil will say, God, no, it is because of the protection. Let's withdraw the protection and see what will become of it. May you not disappoint God. May you not disappoint God. May you not disappoint God in the name of Jesus. And when you pass that test, like Job, there is a double portion. Whatever the devil came to attack will be restored. And then another version of it will be added. You will, you will live in absolute glory. And when the glory of God becomes your shield, it takes you back to the garden of Eden. Everything will be provided and you just have to be a manager for it. So then the king is amazed because now God is trying to show the king something. And it will interest you to know that the king did not even serve God. But when it was time for God to let him begin to see his sovereignty, he opened his eyes. Let's read a little bit from the verse 24 of Daniel chapter 3. He said, Then the book Adnezah the king was astonished and rose up in haste and spake, said unto his counselors, Did we not cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? 
They answered and said unto the king, True, O king. 25. He answered and said, Lo, I see four men loose. I see four men loose, walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no head. And the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. How did he know the Son of God? But because God was bent on using the book of Nazar, like I said from the beginning, to be a voice, because the trumpet of Nebuchadnezzar blows louder than all these Hebrew boys joined together. Nebuchadnezzar had authority and he had power. So where he stood, when he speaks, it echoes further than any other um, Ju Judean or any other um, Hebrew boys that was brought into Babylon. But God will not tell you that this is what he's doing. You just have to align properly. So I said the other time that the best thing to do here on earth is to travel very far into heaven and see your script, the blueprint about your life, and you walk with it. That is where you get to the point and say, not my will, but thine. Because my will would, would want me to escape this very difficult life. But not my will, thine. Not my will, but thine. How many of us can say that, let the will of God, uh, uh, I mean, God be done? Let the will of God be done. It's easier said than done, brethren. Sometimes you don't even say it with your mouth, but your spirit is already yielding. Whatever happens, Lord, let your will be done. That is the point that we are talking about. So God wanted Nebuchadnezzar to pick this very strong revelation about the fact that there is a fourth man. There is another being. And that is like the son of God who was in their midst. He said they were bound. I remember I gave the instruction that very strong soldiers be sent to bind them. But now I'm seeing a fourth man and they are all loose and they are walking about in the midst of the coals of fire. Who walks in the midst of fire? And where did the fourth man come from? The supernatural, the miraculous power. But all these wouldn't have been achieved if the Hebrew boys did not allow themselves to play that role that God has assigned for them as far as this miracle is concerned. And they were not told aforehand. They did not have any idea what was going on. 26. Then the book Nebuchadnezzar came near to the mouth of the burning fiery furnace and spake and said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Ye servants of the Most High God, come forth and come hither. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came forth of the midst of the fire. So now the book had had made a very important statement God wanted to make from the beginning. That these are the servants of the Most High God. So the image that I made, that I created, that I was compelling them to bow to, that they refused. Now I've accepted that it is a lesser God. Because there is a God most high, which have these ones as servants of his. And that is what God wanted to say. If Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego has stood somewhere and said that we serve the God most high, so nobody should serve the God of Nebuchadnezzar, they would have been beheaded before the last statement. But because they were working with God and they were fully aware of the fact that their lives are sacrifices unto the altar. They allowed God to be God. They said, God is able to deliver us. In fact, God will deliver us. And I'm telling you that just in case he decides not to deliver us, we'll still not give up. That is the level of faith that they had. They moved their faith to trust and they were ready to die for what they believe. Brethren, are you ready to die for what you believe? Whatever you believe, you should be ready to die for it. That is the level of Christianity we need to get to. Else, we cannot hand it over to the next generation. The people that came before us, they were ready to die. They laid their lives down so that the gospel will be moved from one generation to the other. That is why we have the gospel at hand now. What are we doing? What are we putting in there so that the next generation can carry on? We are all very selfish and running after our lustful desires. When you see a group of us praying and chanting, it's because we need things from God and, and God my, and, my, and my car and God money and God I need to buy a piece of land and God my business. Selfishness galore. That is all that we do. When you see a lot of us fasting, it's because of what we need, what we want to get. That is why most of us have run away from the most difficult of the pillars of our faith, which is giving. 
when you pray, most often than not, 99% of the prayer is about you. What God will do for you and my health and my children and my wife and my husband and my lipstick and my gloss, as Prophet Anna will say. If you are fasting because you want spiritual power, so everybody will see that your, your spiritual giftings are very sharp and, and you are very quick. Your prophetic radar is very high. It's, it is still about you. But when you give, it's, it's as if you are losing something. So most people don't fast the way we fast. They don't pray the way we pray, but they are givers. And that is what has opened the realm of power to them. Nobody wants to give. We don't want to give our service. We don't want to give our skills. And we don't want to serve in the house of the Lord. You don't want to be a blessing to your neighbor. You don't even want to spend time to pray for your friend. You don't want to spend time to have fellowship with your friend. All what you are doing is competition. And Bible calls you a fool. Because he said, them that compare themselves one unto the other are not wise. I did not say it. And the Bible is saying, then you are a fool. So let's get out of competition. We are called to complete. We are not called to compete. You are my brother. I'm your brother. I celebrate the grace of God upon your life because I need it. And you celebrate what I carry because you need it. And together, we build that spiritual house because we are all cornerstones. And Jesus Christ is the chief cornerstone. But when the stone begins to fight, each stone begins to fight and wants to be the one that will be seen, you cannot stand alone. If you stand alone, you are as useless as anything. Your strength is in our togetherness. And the Holy Spirit begins to bind us together. So when Daniel got the opportunity to be promoted, he called these three other brothers and they were promoted together. That is the strength of the church. You are not encouraging your brother because you don't want him to be seen. You don't want the, the gospel that God is using him to propagate to be seen. You are so full of yourself. If it's not about you, then nobody else should, should be out there. That is a very selfish, myopic, self-centered lifestyle. And it will take you nowhere. That is what we call the devil syndrome. It's about me, 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 me. When it's about you... You are not a blessing to the kingdom. And you don't even um, put God under any obligation to keep on giving you the breath of life. Because whatever God created gives life. What are you giving life to? Who are you sacrificing your life to? I had a discussion with my people the other time. And we're talking about the fact that if we ask this general question, what has God done for you? Everybody will have a whole list that will not finish now. But if you ask the, the reverse, what have you done for God? You hear answers like, um, well, ish. Chale, you be serious. That is the level where we are. We are just there to take. So we treat God like an ATM machine. If he's not bringing the machine out after you slot your card, that's where you see people hitting the machine because it's like there is a fault so that the machine will just vomit money. When we realize that the money is finished in the machine, we take the card and we look for the next available ATM machine. God is not an ATM machine. No. And the Hebrew boys have proven to us that they were not treating God like an ATM machine. They were ready to get stuck with him. They were, they've been with him. They are going to be with him for the rest of their lives. And because of that, God wrought wonders in their life. And look at it. Nebuchadnezzar declaring now after the same man had constrained these people to serve and bow to an idol and they refused. Now he's changed his, his statement and he's saying that these are the servants of the Most High God. What is the enemy saying about you? Because we give up so easily. So the enemy will not take our God seriously. But if you can hold on, if you can go through that period where your boss decides not to promote you because you decide not to sleep with him, where your madam decides not to increase your salary because you decide not to sleep with her, and you hold on, God will come through for you. And your honor will be greater. And the glory will go to God in heaven. And it will cause these your wicked boss or your wicked madam to begin to seek for the God that you claim you serve. They might not serve your God, but they will make a statement that will cause a lot of people to consider your God. And chances are that you will win some. Because they will say, ah, I did all this to this young man and he's still around. He must be serving a strong God. And people will move towards that um, angle. That is what we are looking at. So look at it from that, that spectacle that God is using my life for a message. I was telling my friends the other day that, you see, the Bible has been written, but our life are also different chapters and different verses of the Bible. Make sure that you keep that verse added. When somebody sees you walking or behaving in your workplace and the way you deal with your children and your wife, they should be able to read something from your attitude. And that is another verse of the Bible. 
That's another chapter of the Bible. So you are walking and people are reading your life and it is helping them to connect to God. People saw the apostles and they said, these ones we can perceive they have, they have, they have been with Jesus. When people see you, what are they able to say concerning your life? Can they say that this one has had an encounter with Christ? Or all we do is the badge that I am a believer, I am a Christian. Enough of the badge, it will not take you anywhere. It will not take you anywhere. You can parade everywhere and show people that you are a deacon or you are a pastor or an apostle. But where it matters, you are not known. So you will stand before the throne room of grace one day. And as the judgment is going on, you will boast of all the credentials and the things you've done here on earth. And the verdict will be that, you workers of iniquity, I don't know you. May that not be my portion. May that not be your portion. May God deliver us that whatever we do, it will be what God wants us to do exactly. So let's look at the verse 28 and then we would um, finish with the verse 29 and 30. And we will see what happened at the end of the day. 28 said, Then Nebuchadnezzar spake and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who had sent his angel and delivered his servants that trusted in him and have changed the king's word and yielded their bodies that they might not serve nor worship any god except their own god. Now, Nebuchadnezzar is describing God. He said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Blessed be the God of Amma. Blessed be the God of Prince. Blessed be the God of Mimi, of Patience. May that be your statement. May somebody bless God because of you. So you see, brethren, if we don't serve God well, people will see us and curse our God. Haven't you heard statements like, ah, now, when so so see your sorry. Those of you who don't hear Greek, what I'm trying to say is that, the, haven't you heard statements like somebody saying, does this one also serve God? Does this one belong to this church? I doubt. Because I know people that worship from this church. This is not the way they behave. May that not be your story. It is a curse to the God we serve. But the unbelievers and the heathen must say that, blessed be the God of Theophilus Lamte. Because I've seen something about your philosophy that is causing me to want to see his God and serve him. So because he sent his angel, how would Nebuchadnezzar see that God can send an angel to deliver and to save his people if they decided to compromise just before they were thrown into the fiery furnace? They could have compromised that, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, I really didn't mean to um, be rude to you. In fact, let me just bow. You know, it's nothing. Just, just to bow a little to your God is really nothing. And that is our story. That's what most of us do. A little compromise is not too bad. A little or more, the value is the same. So there is no little sin. Small sin, big sin, they are all the same. When you put them on the scale, it is sin. So when you compromise a little, it is sin. When you compromise big, it is sin. It's either you compromise or you don't compromise. That is the best way to go. So we shouldn't compromise at all. If they had compromised, it will not get to the point where Nebuchadnezzar will know or see and believe that God can send an angel to rescue people that trusted him. He said, the, the servant that trusted in him. So when you trust God, the enemy will see that God can deliver you. When you trust your God, the wickedness of the world will not have a hold on you. And at the end of the day, they will make a statement to bless your God. Hold on, my brother. 29, he said, therefore, I make a decree. Beloved, when you trust God and God comes through for you, the enemy who has authority will make a decree. Let's look at the decree of Nebuchadnezzar. That every people, nation, and language will speak anything amiss against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be cut into pieces and their houses shall be made a dung hill because there is no other God that can deliver after this sort. Why? In the beginning, Nebuchadnezzar said, let us see that God that can deliver you from my hands. And indeed, when the three Hebrew boys yielded themselves to the challenges and the punishment of Nebuchadnezzar, God comes through for them in a remarkable way. And the king changes his statement. He said, there is no God that can deliver after this sort. After what I have done, it's not possible for anybody to get out of this grip. 
but your God has gotten you out. That means your God is the, is the greatest. He said, if anybody says anything wrong against this God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, against this God of Theophilus Lamte, against this God of Mimi Lamte, against this God of Elder Magjoris, against this God of Pastor Ross, against this God of Patience and Faustina and Ajoa and Prince, anybody who is listening to me now, put your name there. Anybody that will say anything wrong against your God, may they be cut into pieces and may their homes be like the dung hill. Nobody can trace them anymore. But that will only happen if we can believe God, if we can have faith in God, and if we can trust Him even with our life. May God strengthen you. May God empower you. Let's see what happened after Nebuchadnezzar made this decree. And that is the 30. And that is where we draw the curtains. He said, Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of of Babylon. That promotion you are looking for will not come on a silver platter. It will come after you've gone through the problems and the challenges in the hands of the wicked one. Then God will give them a miracle to see through your life and they will have no option than to favor you. The favor you are looking for will not come through prayer and fasting. It will come through obedience to God's word. It will come through allowing God to you use you for his purposes because the enemy will only favor you when they see the spirit of God upon your life. So when they saw the spirit of God upon the life of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego through the ordeal that they passed them through, knowing very well that this is an impossible situation and God comes through for them, then they favor them. It means that, Kai, these people are carrying something dangerous. I must, I must favor them. That, that is where you get to a place where people don't like you, but they are compelled to do things for you. I don't like you, but I just want to bless you. May that be your story from today in the name of Jesus. These are young men who are serving God, resolute in their, in their decision to serve God. They will not budge for anything. They are ready to die, even if God decides not to rescue them. Their faith is intact. May our faith be intact. May our faith be intact. So let's just, um, just to round up a little bit, just to bring out a few pointers. These are the, cha- the, the, the charges that were brought against the three Hebrew boys. One, he said, they have no regard for the king. That is what the people came to report to the king. He said, they have no regard for the king. They decided not to serve the God of Nebuchadnezzar and they decided that they will not worship, bow down and worship the image. That was the charge that was brought in. Nebuchadnezzar tried to give them an escape route. He said, Let, let's do the routine all over again so that you, you at least bow this time because he was trying to inject fear in them. They refused the fear and the man got furious. That he said, the fire that was prepared for you, now hit it seven times. Probably he was thinking they will still reconsider because it's, it's still early days yet. You, you, can, you can reconsider and then back out. The boy said, no, don't worry about playing the flute and harp again for us to bow. We, we, we will not bow. No, no, we will not bow. No matter what you do. So save the energy of your people that we will not bow. Our God is able to deliver us. And yes, he will deliver us. But just in case today's time is not to deliver us, we will still not bow. We will, not, we will still not save you. We, 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 are, we are ready to die. That is faith that is resolute. Faith that has changed gear to trust, even if I die. So when we get to the place where we appreciate the fact that our life are sacrifices on the altar, we are a living sacrifice unto God. We don't care what happens to us. We are ready to give our life to God. And the Bible is true. He said, if you give your life to him, you will receive it here and the life after. These people received their life, but there was a miracle that was attached to it. They came out of the fire and nobody could smell the fire on them. Their clothes were not burned, their hair were not burned, nothing happened to them. And a fourth man joined them in there. Whatever fire you find yourself in, I pray for you this moment that the helper, the Holy Spirit will come and be with you. And when you come out of that situation that the enemy thought is so devastating, nobody can even smell it around you because they, they couldn't smell the fire around them. Their clothes did not burn to show that they've been through fire. Their hair did not burn for them to see that they've gone through fire. And you see, even when you pass through smoke, when you pass through fire, there is some smoke, some smoky smell that you get. They did not get it. You will also not get it in the name of Jesus. When people see you, you will not look like what you've been through because of the fourth man in your life. Because you've decided to stand for God irrespective of how dangerous the situation is. And I know that that will be your story 
in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Beloved, this is how we bring today's discussion to a wrap. And I pray that God has spoken to you in diverse ways that is beginning to minister to you right now. That you are not too young. God can use you for his purposes. And God has an agenda for whatever you are going through right now. If you can accept and believe and become resolute to stay with God and be on the right path, God will glorify himself in your life. Don't yield to sin. Don't back out. No matter the way they frustrate you and they push you so hard to back out, don't back out. See the light at the end of the tunnel. That God is doing something with my life. My life will become a testimony. There is something miraculous about what is going on. I might not understand. Yes. In fact, I don't understand. But I know that I am still connected to God. I am still connected to heaven. I see the the blueprint of my life right in front of me. And I know that he said all things will together work for my good. Because I love him. Only love the Lord and everything else he will take care of it. He said whatever is committed to him is faithful to keep. If you commit your life to him, you will keep it till the very end. I want to encourage you to send this to as many people as possible. If it's been a blessing to you, then you want to share it. You want to encourage them to subscribe and click on the notification button so that whenever we load new videos, they will be able to get an alert as well. We've been talking about young people in ministry. Last two weeks, we were dealing with Daniel as a case study. Last week and this week, we focused on the three Hebrew boys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. We've looked at how they went through all the challenges and they stood firm for God because God wanted to use Nebuchadnezzar to make a statement and they didn't even know. If they had backed out, the assignment of God would have failed and God will have to rewire someone else. It would have taken so long a time. So when you fail God, God has to find somebody else but the time will not be the same. Understand that whatever you are going through, God is aware and God is trying to do something with your life. Don't yield to sin. Go through it the hard way and God will send the fourth man eventually. And your life will become a miracle and a testimony to the glory of his name. My name is Theophilus Lamte and this has been the Theophilus Lamte Ministries on YouTube and Facebook. But this program especially is dubbed Being the Help I Needed. I want to be the help I needed whilst I was growing up and I'm sure you also want to be the help you needed whilst you were growing up. Together we say may God bless and keep you. May he let his face shine upon you and be glorious unto you. In Jesus' mighty name, we are praying with thanksgiving. See you again next week. Bye-bye for now.